realize that because it just fell down my slide. <laughs> but it's a good morning. It's good that we can come together and worship together at one. Today is World Communion Sunday, and for those that aren't familiar with that, it's something that's been around since the 1930s. It originated in the Presbyterian Church, and it grew beyond that to other denominations. Now, I have to admit that not all United Methodists, not all Presbyterians, but many churches uh, regardless of our denominations, we've set aside this Sunday to come to the table to be reminded that though we may have theological differences, we are all one body in Jesus Christ. So we're going to carve out time later in the service to, to celebrate Holy Communion together as one body here at Huntington Court. And as we eat and as we drink, we'll be reminded of our brothers and sisters, wherever they may be gathered around the world today, they may have already had communion or be having it, later today and we just remind ourselves that we are all um, one body in Christ and we consider what part we're called to play in that body. I've got a couple of quick announcements to make as well as prayer concerns. Uh, we'll be meeting after church, charge conference for those leaders. Anybody of course is invited to come but uh, we'll have our charge conference following worship. Uh, we'll meet over here so it will just give us some time to set up. Normally I'd greet you at the back door guys. I'm just going to say Reach yourselves and uh, love on yourselves and make yourself comfortable. Unless you want to hang out with me at Charge Conference, like I said, you're welcome to, to do that as well. But that will we'll come off of YouTube on that one and we'll come back up a second time for Charge Conference. A um, couple of things that you need to know. You saw up there we mentioned last week we were having trunk or treats. You know, we haven't been able to celebrate that for a while to provide a safe place for kids in our community to, to come together. We've had as low in the 12 plus years I've been here, I think it's 500. We've had as many. It's over 1,200, so we need your help. We need vehicles, and we need candy. Um, my hope is, is that you can do both, but I know not everyone can. So if you can come bring a vehicle, we'd love to see you here, uh, as many vehicles as possible. We'd love to see you also dress up, but I know not everybody wants to dress up, but that's okay. I'm going to shamelessly say I'll still take your car and your candy and uh, see you on the back lot. Uh, but if you say, Jeff, I just can't do that. My, my legs can't hold up that long. I can't do it. Um, we still need candy. I mean, think about this. You got between 500 to, we've said it could be as high as 1,500 kids. I don't know. I know we've had up to 1,200 plus in the past. So we need candy. So start bringing candy to help us out as a church so we can make a safe place for kids to have trunk or treat. As for prayer concerns, a couple of quick ones. Uh, I ask that you pray for those in our world, you know, especially as they're uh, coming uh, through this hurricane. Many are still getting the effects of the tropical storm, what's left of it. Um, but those in Cuba, Florida, other places, you know, that are feeling that South Carolina. So prayers for them. Also consider how can you play a part in this? You know, we mentioned before, you know, as a denomination, we've been collecting buckets for UMCOR, you know, flood buckets, because one of the things we try to do as a denomination is be the first on the ground and the last to leave when there's a disaster. And because of so many natural disasters over the last year, we are, as a denomination, out of flood buckets. Um, so if you need to find out, I know that it's in the newsletter, what it takes to put those together. I saw about five or six out there today. We're going to be doing that through the month of October. So consider if you could put one of those together or come together as a group or a family to put together a flood bucket. Uh, so we can get and provide relief, especially now during this trying time. For those we need to remember, I know Louise Carrico has a procedure on six, so prayers for her, and also prayers for David Deck over the loss of his brother Jimmy this past week. If you have other prayer concerns, I invite you to contact Laura and either email her or call her, or just go online and submit those to us. So, business is done, prayer concerns are shared, time to worship. So let's pray. Gracious God, you've caught us, invited us into this place, to this space, wherever we may be right now, to grow an understanding of who you are as always, but also what it is that you desire of us as your people. So we ask that you give us ears to hear, hearts that are open and willing to grow. We pray this through your son, Jesus. Amen. You know, we brought back a couple of weeks ago uh, the passing of the peace. We said we knew people still didn't feel comfortable at that, but we, we need to make sure people feel welcome. So I'm going to invite you now at this time to stand and uh, reach out to those around. If you want a fist bump, wave, 
whatever you feel comfortable with. But I invite you to welcome those that are around you. So let's stand and greet those around us in the spirit of Christian love. Hello again. Bread, one body, page six twenty. song this morning, I give you my heart. Uh, I just want to encourage you to use this song to do just that. Put yourself in a posture that you can just give your heart to God fully and completely. Is there something holding you back that you're not able quite to give God everything that you need to give of you?
Father, that's our prayer this morning, that you would have your way, God, in our lives, that we would be willing to give it all to you, those dark places that we don't want anyone else to see, Father. We know you see them. And God, I just pray that we would remove any barrier in our life that would keep us from you. And we know that that's your desire, Father, to have a close relationship with us. That's why your son died, to give us eternal life, Father. I just pray this morning that you open our hearts, give us eyes to see and ears to listen, Father, as your word is spoken in truth. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You know, for those that know me, I'm one of those that like to plan summers in advance, and I let them digest, you know, let them ferment within me for a while. And then as I got closer to today, and I was thinking about today's message, I think, do I really want to deliver it? I, it it's been redone so many times. And, and I was thinking, this is more of a, a, a teaching moment than, than a preaching moment today. And I say that because, you know, there's sometimes that I would, I, I would say, this is something you want to share with your friends online. This is for those that have been hanging out with me for the last year plus, you know, online or in person. It's a heart to heart. I could almost see myself just like if I were teaching, just pull a, uh, you know, stool up here and just sit and have a true, honest, heart to heart conversation with us as a church, those that call ourselves Huntington Court. So that's what I'm hoping we're going to do. We're just coming together like a church family right now just to learn, to set the groundwork for where we need to be going forward as a church. So I'm just hoping that's the heart you'll bring with you today when I share this message. So with that said, you know, while I was gone on vacation, some of you may have seen a segment. It was run on WDBJ7 back on September 15th, and it looked at trends within Christianity. I had some of you thinking, well, that was Something new for me is something I had heard, something I had knew, something I, I'd been experiencing. But that day in their segment, what they were talking about is that they truly believed that if trends in society continued that by 2070, that those who claim to be Christians would become a minority in this country. We've seen that, you know, over the years. And part of it, people will say, well, it's influx of people. No, it's really more have been moving into the category of nuns and duns. Nuns and duns mean nuns. They're not religiously affiliated with anything. And uh, duns means they're just done with church or done with Christianity altogether. I say that because when I went together with leaders, I usually share, I start throwing stats out there just to get them to think. And, and, and one of the people I like to follow is Kerry Newhoff and, and uh, this church pastor slash guru that, that I truly believe is on top of trends. And I was so excited on Friday when I was doing continuing education to see that, hey, he's going to be at the conference in Kansas that I like to go to, so I'm going to make sure that I go hear him. But in Newhouse Post a couple of months back, he was talking about how we, we as the church, not just Huntington Court, we as the church universe, how many of us have, have fared since the pandemic began. So I want you to put that in context. And he says, you probably remember the predictions back in the spring of, of 2020. In fact, I heard some of you having these conversations with me. You, you, you kept saying, you know, as soon as churches reopened, reopened for in-person services, that you truly believed the people would flood right back. You know, they were going to be missing church. They'd come flooding back. They'd be embracing friends they hadn't seen for weeks and for months. But then, as we know, the lockdown continued beyond weeks. In months, some cases, many of us, years. <laughs> but then there were many pastors like myself. We kept hoping, you know, if they're not coming back now, we told ourselves the people will come back in the fall. Or then we said, like after Christmas, Easter, said, they'll come back after Christmas. Or, or when the mask mandates were, were lifted. Or when most people were vaccinated, we said, or after summer break, they'd be back. Or after all the restrictions were lifted. Or once the kids were back in school full time, but now we're almost three years, <laughs> three years. And as, as he points out, the great return to the church has become the great realization that maybe they're not coming back. Maybe not now, not tomorrow, maybe not ever. 
And as I say that, I know there are some that were angry. I, I was, I've listened to my pastor friends. I even listened to Adam Hamilton this week talking about how he, he's still getting hate letters for how he and that church handled how they went through it as a church. I know I had people that were angry. They've had some one-on-ones with me. And we know that some people left angrily because we either said the wrong thing or didn't say the right thing. Or some churches, you know, they, they didn't like how we handled COVID. They didn't like how we handled the, you know, mask, non-mask. And then you got this all the other stuff that's going on in our world. You got, you know, racism and politics. And you got every week they want to talk about climate change. But still, like Newhoff says, it doesn't explain the steep drop that we're seeing. And then so what he started looking at was why the great return wasn't happening. And, 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 and what he did is he started looking back and he invited his readers to step back and to consider where we were pre-pandemic. And which was an honest conversation because he said even pre-COVID, we could divide our churches into two primary groups. We could have two primary groups, the members and the attenders, you know, those that attend but may not be a member, but they were still regular, and the engagers. So the members and the attenders and the engagers. Now, some of you might think that the members and the attenders are the same, but they're not always because they're members. We have what? I think counting the two deaths recently, we probably got 396 members here. I'd love to see 396 here. But that's something that most churches have, uh, you know, Many claim they're members, but we never see them. Uh, attenders of that, they come Christmas and Easter. But then there are those that are engaged. That's you guys. <laughs> you know, those that are, that are here, whether in person or on a regular basis online. Uh, so think of engagers in that way. Engagers are those that want to come to a point of more than just attending. Engagers are those, he said, are people who serve. You know, when asked to serve, they serve people who gave or give. They want to be a part of the community. And, and they want to let others to experience what's going on within the church. So they invite friends. They either invite them in person or, like I said, they invite them to experience what they've come to grow and understand online. And they said if your church was experiencing, or these individuals were experiencing things like serving, giving, part of community, inviting friends, you've got a healthy church because people are being transformed. But as we know, with anything, it's easy to get out of a rhythm. And so think about this. Our doors were closed, and we, we had a lot of people online early on in the pandemic. You know, we were running two to 300 on a Sunday between Facebook and YouTube. But over time, even that number dwindled down. So people, it's easy to get out of a rhythm. It's easy to get out of a habit. And so because of that, the casual attendees, those members that were nominally committed before, they drifted away, leaving mostly, as Newhoff would say, the engagers. The engagers, they either remained online faithfully or they remained in person faithfully. The disengaged, that's what they did. They just disengaged. Now, he said, that's okay, though. It's not an entirely bad thing because you don't grow a church a healthy church, that is, on attendance, you grow a healthy church on engagers. Christians who are engaged with mission, after all, are normally going to attend church. Disengagers aren't. Engagers are going to be healthy. They're going to be excited. They're going to want others to come and experience. In fact, he would say, and I love this, he says, engagement is crucial to discipleship. Jesus never said, come, attend me. He said, come, follow me. And he said, Christians who are engaged with mission, after all, are far more likely to attend church. Disengaged people aren't. So he talked about how we're, we're shifting into a culture of, of now nuns and duns. And he says, which I've said that for years, and you know, you've heard me say this in leadership meetings before, that we've got a society that's truly changing. And how do we do ministry is what I'm constantly inviting us to consider. Not, not just the building, but... But how do we do ministry? You know, we were online before most churches were even online because I really saw that's where we, it's the society we're going and people thought I was crazy. I said, you know, we need kiosks and giving boxes because people don't ask and we're just having this conversation. Young adults don't carry checks. I have talked to churches recently. She's thinking, where is he going with this? I have had pastor friends that are saying, well, we're going to stop. We're going to stop showing our services online because we want our people in the pews. And I'm thinking, God bless you. <laughs> 
because you just lost half your people. Um, I even had a friend of mine saying, we're going to start passing the plate because we don't want them to have access to kiosks or giving boxes. And I'm thinking, but they don't carry checks. <laughs> they don't write checks. They don't carry cash. You're just now people made, made them feel uncomfortable. So we've got all this stuff going on, and, 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 and we've got a society that's becoming, uh, let's just admit it, it's becoming post-Christian. As post-Christian, it's more closer than it's ever been. I've said we were moving that direction anyway, and, and, and it's like the crisis just threw gas on it, and it accelerated it, which means those former occasional attendees and active members are now more likely to identify themselves as nuns and duns. People who would say they have no religious affiliation and they're just simply done with church. Now, they're not going to come to me or many of you. They're going to say, oh, I'm planning on coming back later. And I love how, how he's, he's played it out here, he said, because here's how the dialogue usually plays out. He says, he says, think about how you've had these conversations in the past. And he said, people will come to you and they'll say, well, I'm just not comfortable coming back until all the vaccines are available. And then the following month when we were in the pandemic, they said, well, I'm sure now I'm vaccinated, but I just don't like them wearing masks. And then you got a month after that, it said, well, yes, the mask mandates are gone, but we're not comfortable with our kids being exposed right now. And you got a few weeks later, well, you know, things are getting better, and we haven't traveled for a while, and, and we just want to get some traveling done. And then the last conversation that he said we'd hear is, I'm sure we'll be back, but we just don't know when. I've had people say, hey, you know what? I'm just out of the habit. At least they were honest with me. But yet we see them through their posts, their football games and restaurants, vacations, just not here. And it's hard to build a future on a group when people aren't telling you the truth. So, so New Hoff would say, so what do you do? Do you call them out? Do you argue with them? Do you call their bluff? And the truth is, guys, there's no point in that. Because of all intents, they're gone. And so now we're in the great realization of what do we do next. So you think, hey, man, he just painted something negative here. So here's the good news. Here's the good news is where do we go from here? We mobilize what is left. We focus on the people that have stayed, those that have been engaged in person or online. We focus on those. Yes, we got the reality check. Many of our volunteers haven't come back, but not all the volunteers have left. You know, some of our givers have bailed, but not all of them. So we focus. We focus not on what we've lost. We focus on what we have, and we build off of that. We focus on who's with us. We celebrate each other. We, we, we look for ways to disciple each other, and we encourage them. We look for ways to get engaged. Chris, you think, Jeff, I'm never going to come back again. I appreciated you. When you showed up for Bible study, I could have cried. I love that because I love when people that choose, they're new and to be engaged. I appreciated that. I encourage you to find ways to be engaged. Um, so we look to how do we get people engaged. We look how we, we reignite our members to take on their membership vows seriously. And then we look at those that are engaged. How do we move them to the next step? How do we move them to the next step? So that's what we're going to be doing as a church. And not to over-spiritualize this, you know, I love what Newhoff said. He says, by the time Jesus died, most of the people had deserted him anyway. The church started with 11 remaining disciples in a room full of people who didn't leave. And that small group, that small group was the genesis of a movement that turned the world upside down. Because that's what engaged people are. They are passionate people. They know what mission is. They serve in it, and they live out of it. They're passionate. They look for ways to encourage and invite their friends from what they're experiencing, what they're growing and learning here. Over the long term in a church, we can accomplish more with engaged people than disengaged attendees. The disengaged will continue to dwindle. The engaged Christians will advance the mission of the church. Now, as I say that, only God can bring growth, but God uses people who are engaged to do it. So Newhouse said, embrace your new church. Embrace your new church. Imagine the future, what it would look like moving forward. But he has this a choice. He says, you can keep waiting, you know, um, to go back, because he says, the past is gone. The future is here. He says, you can keep waiting for the past to rehappen, 
or you can focus on the here and now and focus on what's truly important, the mission of the church. Realizing that, yes, we have many online, and how do we leverage the, our online pre presence? I said at 8.30, and I warned Allison right before the service, I said, I want to start looking at ways to, to leverage Facebook groups in the Renwick Valley. I want to look at ways to leverage that in a church context. So I, I told Allison and Alan, we're going to start looking at that going forward. How do we leverage our online presence? How do we take our online presence and make them more engaged as well? How do we make more disciples for Jesus Christ, those that are in person as well as that are those that are online? But to do so, as he would say, it's hard to lead people into the future if you're stuck in the past. It's hard to lead people if we're constantly looking back, thinking we're going to get back to where we were in 1950s, 70, uh, 1990, 2010 when I got here. Heck, I'd say it's hard if we're just looking back to 2020. If we're stuck in the past. So the call is to move forward. So I, I love that article. I would challenge if anybody wants me to send it to them, I'll gladly do that. Uh, but I love the challenge to get into mission. I love the challenge to look at things in new ways instead of bemoaning the past. Um, yes, we have to grieve our losses, but how do we do church? How do we be the body of Christ moving forward? So quick reality check, and then I'll go into the scripture. Reality check, where are we now? Where are we now? You know, those that have heard me in meetings, I, I throw numbers out all the time. I tell people pre-COVID, you know, we were averaging between our two services about 130 people between the two services. The flip side of that, online, Matt will tell me we had probably at best 7 to 12. <laughs> 7 to 12. Now, as I say that during COVID, like I so said, we had 250 to, to 300 watching us online. Now we're down to 77. But that's okay. It's still better than 10 to 12 by the end of the week. Yes, in person, in person, we're doing about 40 to 60. I don't know. I'm having you count from the pews today, so you can give me a number. What do you think it is? 50. About 50. So, so we got about 50. That's less than in person. But you couple them together, we still got a strong nucleus to do church with, to be the body of Christ. So we got, overall, we got one group up, one group down. Past is gone. Future is here. So let's be real with what we got and move on. And we can keep on waiting for things to go back to the way they were, but the past, but statistics say, just open our eyes, things may not go back to the way they were, they were in the past. So we need to get back to doing what's important. What's important is not focusing on the negatives. What's important is looking how together we can make disciples for Jesus Christ. How can we share the good news of Jesus Christ? That's the most important thing that we do as a church, is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We can look at all the other stuff that's going on. We can focus on the building. We can focus on less people, or we can focus on what's important, which is making disciples of Jesus Christ. So we've got a lot of work to do. And to do it, I need your help. We need your help. Whether you're in person or online, we together need to work as a team. We need to be engaged to make a difference in the world around us. The harvest is plentiful, as Jesus would say, but the laborers are few. But we can do a lot with the laborers we've got. And to help us move forward with that, I invite you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 through 2, where Luke writes, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent two by two ahead of them into every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So he said, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to go send out workers into the harvest field. So I want you to picture this as a whole. And this is where I get shameless. Had we been studying Luke as a whole, which we're studying in Bible study, Luke. <laughs> Had we been studying Luke as a whole, we would know the context of what's going on right here. So what's going on? It says, after this. Luke begins with the words, after this. After the... The original 12 had been on their mission trip after they had spent some time traveling and teaching with Jesus after this, after time has passed. After the transfiguration event when, when Peter, James, and John go up on the mountaintop and they see Moses, Elijah, Jesus transfigured after this. 
After this one, Jesus had a tough conversation. We looked at it a couple weeks back. And he gave him the cost of discipleship. He gave him what it looked like, as we were saying today, what it looked like to be engaged. And Luke says many turned away. Many turned away. After this, Jesus sent 72 of them out in pairs. Of those remains, 72 of them were sent out in pairs. And he gave them instructions. If you want to read on, you'll see the instructions he gave. He told them what to do and what not to do. And when they came back from their trip, Luke says the 72 returned, and there was joy. There was joy. After this seemingly successful missionary venture, Luke says there was joy. They found joy in serving. They found joy in serving. They found joy in being engaged with the world around them. And that speaks to what we're called to do. Because there's still a lot of work to do. Now back to the text, verse 2. I, I truly believe it speaks to today. Like I said, the harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Like I said, if you saw that segment on WDBJ7, if you were listening when I shared figures from Kerry Newhoff, I mean, heck, you just open your eyes and look in your pews around you or, or drive by the church. I mean, just go by the Berglund Center on the way home. If y'all know what, like, Elevation was doing, and I, I love the ministry they were doing here with new Christians. They were quickly doing over 3,000 people, and they were down to several hundred. If you just, we just open our eyes. The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. Many have become disengaged. Many be, see themselves as none and done. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few, but they are here. The workers are here. You guys. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few, but we can still do mission together. And so instead of looking at it as a negative, let's look at it as an opportunity. If I were a salesperson, I still have that at the heart of my DNA, and I knew that there's a lot of opportunity to sell out there, baby, I'd be all over it. So we've got a lot of opportunity out there beyond our walls. The harvest is still plentiful. The workers are few, but instead of a negative, let's look at the harvest as an opportunity. There's a huge harvest waiting on us. We just need to make sure that we get our people, us, whether online, in person, engaged. But before getting engaged, you know, it's, it's easy to get excited and go out our doors and do something. But what did Jesus say we should do first from the text? He said, pray. Pray. Ask. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Ask. And then we read the, the, when he sent out the 12, he's basically the same words. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest. Both groups were told to pray. Before we do anything as a church, we pray. I have just had a group of leaders I met with last Monday. I said, before we make any decisions, I invite you to pray, and I'm hoping they're doing that. Pray. Pray for the church that you want us to be. Pray for the strength to keep that, the past and the past, and keep the future always ahead of us. You guys know I work with runners, and one of the things I'm always on their case about is I hate when I see a runner look back. They shouldn't be focusing on the person that's behind them. In fact, I tell them I don't even want to see them focusing on the butt of the guy that's in front of them. I want them to look past that. I want them to visualize the opportunity of finishing strong. And that speaks to us as a church. So pray for strength for us as a church to keep the past in the past and focus on what's ahead of us in the future. In fact, pray that God will provide others, that we'll be excited and we'll look at how together we can do ministry. And then we'll start thinking, God will open our hearts to who can we invite to come and join us in this mission together. Pray that God will open our eyes to see the opportunities before us and then consider what part will I, what part will you play? Which leads to the second thing that we need to be doing. After praying, there comes a point we actually have to do. We actually have to do. We get out of our seats or we, we find a way to get engaged online. The 12, they went out. After they prayed, they went out. The 72, after they prayed, they went out both were engaged in ministry. And, and I was thinking of that this morning when I was coming in, you know, to me, the 12 represent like us that are in person. They came back and they found joy and they did successful ministry. The 72 that went out, it's like you guys online, they went out and they did ministry. Both groups were engaged and they found ways to, 
to be successful in joy. So the question is, wherever we are today, is what part will you play in the harvest because there's much work to be done. Now, if you're a member, if you're a member, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. Are you living into your membership vows? Are you truly engaged with what you, when you publicly came before this congregation, doing those things that you said you would do? If you're a member, I invite you to consider what you claimed before you, uh, this congregation when you joined. You said you would faithfully participate with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your witness. And we said attending means to participate in worship every week, whether in person or online. We had challenged us when we joined the church, I've never had anybody say no, that they were going to find a way to participate in study. You know, whether it's in a small group or uh, in a Monday night or Wednesday Bible studies when we had Wednesdays or or starting our own groups, or spending time in, in devotionals. We challenge our members when they join to say that they're going to commit to doing at least one service activity a year. My hope is always more than just one. Guys, you got an easy one coming up. October 30th, what is it? Trunk or treat. <laughs> easy one. You can cross your box. You got one done. I'm hoping you always do more than one. We also challenge our members to give financially and portion to your income with the goal of tithing. The fifth one we say is to share our faith with others. And the sixth one we say is pray. Pray. And if you're not a member yet and you're just an attendee, that's okay too. If you haven't been baptized yet, that's okay too. That's where we have a one-on-one -on -one talk. You've got to reach out to me and we'll talk about making that happen. Because if you're saying, Jeff, I just don't know yet what part I need to play, then I want you to prayerfully consider what part can you play. What part you play? As we move forward, ask yourself what part can we play? I know some of you got a letter this week, and the letter was geared primarily to, to the financial resources, how you can give as a church. And if you didn't get one of those, I know I saw Gloria put them outside of both doors. Just grab one on the way out. If you're online, you say, I didn't get one of those. I have no idea what you're talking about. You're going to call Lauren and, and say, hey, can you send me one of those letters that Jeff was talking about? But before you just check a box like you've done in the past and maybe put the same amount that you've done in the past, I'm going to encourage you. Ask yourself, are you truly being the steward that God has called you to be? Are you truly giving as God has given and blessed you? I also want you to consider prayer, praying. Are you praying um, for what part that you can play in this church? Are you praying for this church? So examine your prayer life. Will you be praying like Jesus instructed the 12 and 72 to do, that you can see the part that you play and then Hopefully come back and find joy. Will you be giving of your time and energy, seeking each and every day to grow in your understanding of Jesus? Because the harvest is still plentiful, guys. And you were made to harvest. You are made to harvest probably more than ever before in your lifetime. You were made to harvest. As many have wandered from faith and have no idea who this Jesus guy is. We're in a second generation of now children that have no idea of who Jesus is. No idea. So our job as a congregation, those of us who claim the name of Christ, we got to go out and remind people that the good news is still that. It's good news. And that there's still hope. And the hope is found in Jesus Christ. So what part will you play in leading them to Jesus and all that is offered through faith in Him? Let's pray. Gracious God, it is so easy to focus on all the other stuff to forget what's important. And what's important is you've called us to be your hands and your feet. So help us to ask ourselves, what part will we play? What part will we play in the body of Christ to make a difference in the world around us? There's a world that needs to know love, not hate. There's a world that needs to know, know joy and hope. And it's found through Jesus Christ. What part will you play? What part will we play as a church to get that news out there? Amen.
as I said, today is World Communion Sunday. And we briefly looked at anything. And that wasn't a sermon. That's more of a teaching moment, yeah. Um, sometimes you're called to teach. That's what I felt called to do today. Because I want us to be a healthy congregation. Because time of playing church is over. The time of being the body of Christ is now. The opportunities before us, the harvest is plentiful. And we just need engaged individuals to make a difference. And guys, you're here. And I appreciate every one of you, whether you're one of these new guys, like John or Chris is new here, or, or Tim, or one of you that's been around, you're here. And together, we can make a difference in the world around us. We can be the body of Christ. We can be the hands and feet. The question for all of us, though, is what part will we play? Again, the most important thing we're called to do as a church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. You're going to ask me about this, this, or this, but at the end of the day, the most important thing we need to be doing is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. What part will you play? On World Communion Sunday, we are reminded that, that we have differences. Each of our churches, our denominations, are, are wrestling with what that looks like. What part will we play wherever we are, whether we're in Nigeria or Germany, what part will we play to be the hands and feet of Jesus? And that's why I love Holy Communion, because we remember how far Jesus would go. He gave us a glimpse of what he desired of us. He modeled before us what he desired of us. He taught us in those three years what he desired of us. And then he laid the choice before us. He said, go, preach, teach, baptize, go make disciples of Jesus Christ. Basically, go do as I've done. He told the 11 that remained. And then when we get to Acts chapter 2, thousands joined because they were faithful to the task. 11 were faithful. 11 were engaged. And thousands responded. So whether it's 77 online or 50 to 60 in person, when we're faithful, God will bless. And we will make a difference. So what part will you play? So to remind ourselves of the love that Jesus has for us, we come to the table. I love Holy Communion. I love what it represents. I love in our tradition that all can come to the table, and we truly mean all. And if you're a guest, everyone you're thinking, well, does that mean me? All means all. So today I'm going to be, we're going back to liturgy, and we're going to be using word and table number two. It's in your hymnal, number, page 12. But I just invite you to, to join along. Hear the good news. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to be in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I love the liturgy because it says instead of beating yourself up, it says what? Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves his love for us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. So may the Lord be with you. See, you got to give yourself kudos. This is where I get to have fun as a preacher because I know there's been times when we would have 120, 130, 140, and what would I do if it was weak? I'd make you say it again. Guys, you did well. You were right there. You did what that 134 did. So let's do it again just for fun. But you were there. I give you kudos. This is So, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It's a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You created for yourself a world that is filled with diversity, blessed by your breath of life. Rainbow colors the skies and, and the spring and, and the flowers that bloom in the spring. Summer breezes bring garden delight. And now here we are in autumn. And autumn comes your way. 
and we see the work of your paintbrush on every face and tree. In mercy, while we still were held to the chains of our winter of pride, self-righteousness, and historic egos, you loved us steadfastly, delivered us as babes to reflect the beauty and diversity of your grace, your love, to bring us into community of love, hope, and peace. And so with all your people on earth, in every place wherever two or more are gathered together in your name, and all the company of heaven who have gone before us, we praise your name, join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So holy are you. And blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovering sight for the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He, Jesus, healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He ate with the sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, he gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. And he prayed that we might be one, one with you, one as he is with you, Father. And he asked that we might be known by the love we have for one another. On the night which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. After giving thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken, given for you. Do this, eat this, and remember some me. When supper was over, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be the body of Christ in the world around us. Help the left hand and the right hand be one in ministry to all the world. Help the eyes and ears sense your present and coming kingdom. Bring the blessing of the body to bear fruit till Christ comes in final victory and we feast at that heavenly banquet. Amen. Good news is this, the body of Christ, it was broken for all. And the blood of Christ was shed for all. So, we're still doing things a little modified. We didn't come back to normal on that. We're talking about all the things that COVID's changed stuff on us still. Uh, I'm going to have my servers come up, and they'll be masked. You're going to come from the outside, and I'm just going to ask that you still give yourself some space. I'm also going to ask that as, as they serve, if you don't feel comfortable with uh, juice, you know, that's open, you say, or us touching your bread, even though our hands are sanitized, then I'm going to invite you to just say, hey, give me a prepackaged one. And um, the other thing I'm going to ask for you to do is uh, their trash cans, just drop your empty cups there. And so I'm going to just invite you to come. If you need gluten-free, please let us know too.
when we do, when we share the words, we say, may this be in us, the body of Christ, so that we will be the body of Christ in the world around us. Everything that we do is to reflect the love of Jesus Christ, from the things that we say to the uh, things we post, the way we interact if we go out to eat lunch today, to our co-workers at work, how we work together as one body. We are to be the living presence of Jesus Christ. We are invited through this to learn for ways to love as we are loved. Harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. We're called to harvest. Sing our hymn number 614. never comes to a close. So as I've shared, look for ways to be engaged, asking yourself constantly as you pray, what part will you play as an individual here at Huntington Court to be a part of the body of Christ here? What part will we as Huntington Court, as the body of Christ, play out there? So seriously, I want you to take that to heart. Pray. Not just today, with one breath prayer. Pray it for the days ahead. Be faithful to your prayer. Look for ways that you can give of yourself when those opportunities are before you. Look for opportunities to grow and study so when you hear the words of Luke, you'll, you'll hear that call speaking to your heart as well as the 12 and the 72 did. Look for ways as you prayerfully, as you reflect on that letter that you got this week or you're going to grab on the way out. How can you give of your resources so that we together can be a blessing in the world around us? How can we bring glory to God and all that we do. This service is going to come to a close and we'll meet over here for a charge conference for those that want to remain for charge conference. But the rest of you, I invite you to go in peace. Hear the good news. God loves you. Something you learned as a kid, Jesus loves me. This I know. My hope is that you really know it or will grow in your understanding and believe it. And look for ways to live out of that love in the world around you. Go in peace.